All right, hello everyone. Um, this is Group Arms and we're presenting our final design presentation. Um, our product is the active suspension off an ambulance trailer. Um, so going into our problem explication. So in a search and rescue scenario, hikers may find themselves stranded on a very rough terrain with no paved roads within miles of their location. In these situations, it's often required to have a helicopter ambulance transport. However, these trips are extremely expensive. The operational costs of these airlifts are around $10,000 and the patients usually end up footing a bill of over $40,000 in most cases. Typical off-road suspensions on 4x4 vehicles utilize a static passive suspension system, but these are often inadequate for this terrain and will provide extremely uncomfortable rides to the patients. Specialized off-road vehicles are often very expensive and not very flexible in application. This is where our solution comes in. So we have an off-road ambulance um, trailer that utilizes active suspension. So our product utilizes an active suspension system to provide a significantly cheaper alternative. And additionally, we chose to go with the trailer system because it's able to be pulled by many existing off-road vehicle platforms. So it doesn't require a unique vehicle to be purchased and for all that money to go into a whole drivetrain and everything. So it is a significantly cheaper cost alternative to other systems. So going to design goals, we really want to focus on acceleration affecting the human body. So our main caper that we reference repeatedly is ISO 2631, which focuses on mechanical vibration shock um, and a specifically evaluation of human exposure to whole body vibration. So this ISO standard talks about the safe limits to, to vibration in the human body, and it quantifies it using a root mean squared acceleration of a certain acceleration over time data set. Um, and we want to target a value that typical road ambulances have right now, which is quantified as 0.75 meters per second squared. So we wanted to make sure that we were keeping either at this level or below this level for even our extreme terrain cases, which is uh, quite ambitious. We also were considering a one to four hertz a range of a natural frequency of human organs and human body components so that we make sure we're not hitting that resonance frequency that could cause great harm to our patients. In terms of our mode of operation, uh, first we have a terrain mapping algorithm that reads LiDAR data and then creates a map of the terrain. The car then uses wheel data to predict its path through that terrain and then estimates its height. And then finally, the card then calculates the optimal actuator position of the actuator and then adjusts the height of each wheel accordingly. And this is basically a loop that repeats over and over again with a control scheme. In terms of some system specifications, um, our acceleration reduction was actually quite, imp uh, quite impressive. We resulted in a 78% improvement on regular ambulance acceleration um, with our active suspension system. And we also have a passive suspension linked in series. So even if the active suspension fails, we have that passive suspension optimized for off-road comfort. So this passive suspension still showed a 55% improvement on regular ambulance acceleration. We also have a very low unit cost of $16,424 and the operational cost we did not quantify, but we expect it to be very low since there's not too many consumables on this vehicle. And we also utilize a standardized towing hitch, which makes it very flexible for many different vehicles to tow it with a vehicle weight of only 15, 000, 1,500 pounds dry and about 2,000 pounds loaded, which means that's light duty and can be pulled by pretty much any towing vehicle. Our amount of travel is 24 inches, which far exceeds any off-road vehicle out there on the market today. And again, as I stated, we still have an effective passive suspension that's optimized for our environment in case of system failure. And now we will go on a bit into our design work and our mechanical implementation as well. All right, so first I wanna go into the system overview. So here's the actuator suspension wheel assembly. As you can see, we have our actuator, our bearing carriage assembly, our shock and our trailing arm all connected. Um, so this is sort of showing how um, this translates into your range of motion. And here it is showcasing the full 24 inches of travel. And this is just to give you a visualization for when we talk about each component. So now I wanna hand it off to Gwen, who will talk a bit about the suspension geometry and design. All right, so uh, we started out by characterizing basically the suspension geometry and kinematics. Uh, so basically the system can be broken down uh, and modeled as a third, third class lever, basically a a uh, fixed point at one end and an applied load on the wheel in addition to an applied load on the uh, shock mounting location by the actuator in the shock. Uh, so as per our design goal of having a robust system that would function even in the case where the actuator failed, we basically designed around uh, a maximum load not bottoming out the suspension, so not imparting a load directly to the passenger compartment, but rather just using the spring and damper uh, to operate, yeah, even under severe cases. So basically, <clears throat> the um, the uh, lever setup is shown here. Uh, in order to adequately constrain the wheel, it was constrained in five degrees of freedom and allowed to rotate about one. Uh, the for fourth degree is con uh, controlled by the actuator shock, etc. Assembly. 
Uh, this style of arm is described as a trailing arm and it's commonly used in off-road suspension as its packaging factor allows it to be much longer and get more travel relative to other types of suspension. So here's some of that, uh, those alternatives that we looked at and basically did a design matrix for, leading us to choose the trailing arm. So we used some off-the-shelf components to spur our system, specifically the shock absorbers, which is basically a coilover style shock absorber where the spring coils around the shock in addition to the braking system. Uh, the shock absorbers were spec'd based on the values that we calculated for the required mass spring system and the brakes were spec'd based on the mass of the trailer. We also used off-the-shelf wheels and tires, basically specified to be similar to the uh, UTV that would be our ideal towing vehicle. So our design went through a series of iterations. Uh, first, we looked at a slightly different type of geometry where uh, we had sort of an additional degree of control over the positioning of the wheel uh, by using two separate arms, uh, one of which is shown here on the far left. Then we found that basically that introduced unnecessarily wheel position change over the travel uh, and basically generally made the system less robust as it had more moving components and more complex assembly. So we moved to a single arm that basically rigidly fixed the translational position of the wheel. Uh, and then as that was a rather heavy component, uh, we performed some topology optimization to develop a third iteration seen on the far right. All right, so going a bit into the design of our wheel assembly. So here's an exploded view showing all the components. We've got our tire, our wheel. This is a securing assembly that we're gonna be calling the hub assembly since it has a hub in here. Uh, then as our trailing arm as Gwen has pointed out, uh, we also have our caliper here that's just mounted to the trailing arm to facilitate braking with the rotor on the hub. And then this is our dead spindle, which sort of holds everything together. Showing here is a cutoff view to show you the tapered rolling bearings um, inserted into the hub, how that interacts with the dead spindle. So that way this hub is rotating relative to the dead spindle and the hub is bolted to the castle, uh, is bolted to the wheel. Um, the reason this is called a dead spindle is because it is dead, it does not rotate. The wheel rotates relative to the spindle. So going into the hub design, um, so due to the wheels not being driven, the dead spindle design was possible. Our hub rotates relative to the shaft while our shaft remains static. This means fewer moving components and simpler construction. And as I said, a dead spindle design is possible since we don't have an axle running through here that we need to drive. Um, so you can see here the live hub, although this was a very heavily optimized design. Um, this is significantly more complex to machine. It's a five axis part. The dead hub would have been a little simpler without the rotor uh, mounts, but it is still a fairly simple part to machine in terms of CNC. This would be a three axis part and would be significantly cheaper to manufacture. So showing our wheel assembly securement me mechanism, um, this is just showing how everything goes together. So our dead spindle is inserted into here. The hub with the bearings um, are rotating around the spindle and are secured radially there. And our castle nut is providing a force that has a reaction force here, which basically compresses everything together and holds the wheel in place. This also serves a function of pre in the bearings. And in terms of castle nut securement to prevent it from unthreading itself, we will be utilizing what's called a cotter pin, which basically is a pin that will go through the nut and through the screw, and that will prevent the castle nut from unthreading with, uh, through vibration. And this is a typical practice in the automotive industry. Um, so I'll hand it off to Gwen to go a bit more into the FEA. Yeah, so as we can see here, we ran uh, FEA on all of our components for basically a worst case um, bottom impact load, uh, in addition to side loads where it was appropriate. And so we strove for um, adequate, basically, resilience to stress on all of these uh, components. So going into a little bit more depth on that topology optimization I talked about earlier, uh, basically, after running a few different studies with different uh, input parameters, we found that this gave us basically a good result. Uh, this is run using a bottom impact load in addition to a half G side impact load. Uh, with a criterion for 60% mass reduction relative to the rectangular solid that we started out with uh, as a bounding box. So here we see some details on the uh, V2 and V3 iterations. Uh, the initial result of the topology optimization uh, was actually about the same mass as the V2 iteration, uh, but had approximately twice the factor of safety. Uh, so we basically removed a little bit more material and reduce the mass down under 100 pounds uh, while man maintaining a higher factor of safety and less deflection. Uh, additionally, something that's not noted here is that this reduced our manufacturing costs of our trailing arm cast by about $1,000. Uh, 
Um, so going a bit into our manufacturing plans. So for our trailing arm, our, our initial, this is our sort of our order of operation here. So we'll create cast for the trailing arm. So it'll be a CNC mold without certain features such as holes and complex geometry, such as the mounting ears for the caliper. Then we'd pour cast alloy steel into the cast to create the part, perform finishing operations. So that would be the holes precision machining on certain dimensions, such as press fits areas. Uh, and that would be the basic mode of operation for manufacturing for the trailing arm. For the hub, this is just a three axis CNC part. And the CNC for the, with the three axis is required due to the complex ear geometry for the rotor. That's why it's not just a simple lathe part. Uh, the dead spindle is actually a very simple part, the simple lathe part with threading operations. However, it does require very high precision uh, for some of these dimensions because the press fit over a long length. So that will increase the cost by a little bit. Um, so going a bit into the trailing arm cast. So as I mentioned before, the optimization of our trailing arm shown here reduced cost by about $1,000, actually a little over $1,000. Uh, and these are basically the main hold features that need to be drilled out. Um, this one right here, the spindle hole is actually a press fit, so that doesn't need to have a decent amount of precision. And then this brake sensor and mounting ears hole and, and holes uh, do need to be CNC'd as well in a post operation. Um, then here are the part drawings just showing you into it. I'm not going to go too big into detail, but you can just see for yourself. And then this is our hub showing all the dimensions here. And then this is our dead spindle. All right, now we'll be going into a mechanical system for actuation, so I'll be handing off. So for our actuator specification, we wanted a one degree of freedom linear actuator that we would place in series with our shock system in order to give us our full range of motion uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, in order to meet the design requirements of our uh, minimum step height to determine the force, uh, our wheel travel requirement and our oscillation requirement, um, we use the following specifications. Um, calculating impact energy um, translates to the impact force that we'll see uh, using the equations here, namely the work energy theorem, uh, which translates to about four or 7,430 newtons required for each actuator. And after applying a factor of safety of two uh, to each actuator, just to account for any harsher terrain we might experience, uh, we established a force requirement of 14,860 newtons of continuous force per actuator. For the travel requirement, uh, because of a motion ratio of two to one from the wheel to the shock, uh, for 12 inches of wheel travel with just the actuator, we expect a six inch actuator travel. And for the speed requirement, um, in order to oscillate four times a second, we need 48 inches per second of actuator travel. Next slide. Uh, so with these in mind, uh, we selected the Tolematic 64 RSA HT actuator with the BNL53 motor. This supports um, 15 and a half thousand Newton peak continuous thrust, uh, customizable lengths up to 60 inch and a peak speed of 63 inches per second, which uh, meet and exceed all three of our requirements. This actuator, as you can see below in the animation, is placed in series with the shock uh, using a bearing carriage device in order to constrain all degrees of freedom except for the vertical degree. Uh, for this bearing carriage, um, we designed a clevis uh, in order to mount both the actuator and the shock to it. Uh, you can see the tops uh, where the clevis or where the actuator mounts is an oval just to uh, manage any over constraint coming from there. And um, with the FEA of this clevis, we saw a factor safety of about 10, um, meaning that this will definitely not be the first thing to fail, uh, which is good because it is a more difficult to machine component. And here's just a drawing of that actuator clevis um, with specified tolerances for um, hole mounting to the off the shelf bearing carriage that we are going to buy. Now for the chassis system, um, the main thing here is a square tube chassis. Uh, we selected this in order to balance the bending strength that we'll see across left and right wheels, along with component integration and manufacturability. Uh, square tubes are very easy to put together. Um, we chose 4130 steel for its high weldability while remaining stronger than standard steels. And um, with the thicknesses specified here on the right uh, color coded, we have a current weight of about 650 pound chassis weight. And this will hold a passenger, EMT, and um, patient, as well as any medical equipment. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So for the FEA of this, we chose three major load cases. Um, the first is the uh, maximum continuous actuator force on each wheel um, simultaneously. 
The second is maximum continuous actuator force on one wheel while fixing the other side, which is very conservative. Um, and the third is just a uh, harsh braking load or acceleration load, just proving that we can be towed by any vehicle that we choose. Uh, with these loadings, um, simulating you know bumps, drops, accelerations, basically anything you'd see on an off-road, uh, we got a minimum FOS of 1.55, uh, which implies that our actuator will definitely fail before the chassis. This is much easier to replace as an off-the-shelf component, and it is less dangerous to the patient. Uh, for our trailer hitch, we chose a high misalignment, three degree of freedom uh, off the shelf part. Uh, this allows for very high degrees of rotation um, any which way um, the terrain requires based on our off-road um, circumstance. It's rated to 11,000 pound gross trailer weight, which is far beyond what we uh, will ever put onto our trailer. For the interior, um, the most important thing here is the how to secure the patient in the stretcher to the frame. Uh, we do this using the eight D-Ling loops, loops that you can see at the top right. These are just welded to the chassis and um, are tied down using Velcro straps. Uh, the floor panel is made from a wood core with vinyl coating for weather resistance, and the outer and inner panel are made from aluminum uh, just to offer uh, debris protection, uh, weather protection, as well as mounting flexibility. We also have a roll-up door here um, for ease of access uh, without taking up too much space and uh, three shelving units, a large one for uh, larger equipment such as oxygen tanks, a small one for on-hand first aid for the EMT specifically, and a defibrillator case just in case. And finally for manufacturing, uh, the two frame will be welded up in stages. You can see on the right here, uh, it'll be uh, just stacking up the frame from uh, most to least critical pieces. Uh, finally, all the tabs like suspension tabs will be welded onto the frame. Uh, finally, um, all of the external components will be attached, including the electronics. And then VHB tape, very high bond tape, will be used to weld the body panels to the frame. And finally, the interior shelving and the cushioning will be installed. Okay, and this is our uh, hardware selection for our electronic system. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, as far as sensors go, we have a rotary encoder that's put on the trailing arm hinge to get uh, the wheel location relative to, to the chassis that was selected to be a 1024 PR quadrature rotary encoder, uh, just has high resolution. Um, for the IMU, we selected a 9DOF BNO uh, 055. Um, which has a uh, pretty good uh, reliability and a fast update rate, which is pretty helpful in our application. For our LiDAR, we have the new Vision Titan S1. Uh, it's used for getting, you know, the terrain map data uh, so we know what the terrain is that the car will be driving over. Um, we picked this one so because it has a fast update rate and uh, sufficient vertical and horizontal resolution at that high rate. And the wheel speed sensor is just a basic uh, three axis magnetometer um, that can measure a rotating magnet on the wheel. As for computational and electrical stuff, uh, our primary computer is a custom GPU. It's called an NVIDIA Drive PX2. Uh, NVIDIA has a custom line of GPUs meant for automotives. Um, and we primarily are interested in this because our terrain map generates so much data that needs to be processed so quickly that we need an extremely powerful GPU to handle that. Um, as for our battery, we're using just a one-fourth scale version of the battery in the Tesla Model 3 that has 32 kilowatts at least of power draw, and our actuators each are spec to use three kilowatts. So eight kilowatts, 32 divided by four, uh, is more than enough for our consistent continuous actuation. And finally, for the CPU to go along with the GPU, any decently powerful CPU will do. Primarily, we care about doing computations on the GPU. It's many, many rotations uh, with a lot of data. Uh, sensor placement. We have, as mentioned, we have our uh, wheel speed sensor on the wheel. It's or rather, it's at the end of the trailing arm and it measures a rotating magnet on the wheel. We have two LiDAR sensors, just each in front, uh, front left and front right of the trailer. 
and our rotary encoder is uh, mounted to the chassis and the trailing arm, which measures the trailing arm's angle. So moving on to our sensing and algorithmic implementations. Um, initially, we did an analytical sensor simulation to get some good approximations for the models for our sensors um, and to test a couple initial algorithms. Um, this was done in Python, created uh, various models for actuator position sensors, IMU, gyroscope, wheel speed sensor, and a laser um, to model the most element, most uh, elemental part of the LiDAR. Um, and actuator motion and chassis motion could be measured, um, basic model of that as well. And this uh, we used it to test some initial algorithms, such as, for example, some noise reduction with a really basic uh, initial state estimator on the right there. Then we moved on to a physics-based simulation in WeBots um, that was used for um, data collection and more advanced algorithm testing. Um, most of that algorithm testing was done in post, just with sets of data collected from this test bed. Um, tested various different kinds of terrain in this. You can see in the bottom left there, a step down and a step up and various ramps and jagged terrain, just to see how the algorithms would perform in those scenarios. Once we had a full car simulation, um, we added sensors to that as well and created accurate sensor models with noise and uh, everything else implemented as uh, our components would uh, specify and modified it, uh, modified our algorithms so they could run real time in this uh, environment to uh, simulate you know, the full algorithm pipeline. All right, so now I'll talk about our uh, LiDAR terrain mapping subsystem. Uh, we attach LiDAR sensors to the front of our trailer in order to get a map of the terrain immediately in front of the trailer. Uh, this will get uh, data points in the lo co local coordinate frame of the trailer. Uh, in order to generate an actual map, we must uh, apply derotation and positional translation to these local LiDAR readings so that we are able to stitch them together and form an actual terrain. Uh, due to a WeBots bug, we were unfortunately only able to have one layer of LiDAR readings per time step. Uh, there's a visualization of the bug on the bottom right there. Uh, very unfortunate, but we did increase the data rate of our LiDAR sensor to compensate and effectively make it act like it had multiple layers. So in order to apply derotation, we use an Euler angle rotation. Uh, matrix. Um, we have an onboard IMU that records the roll, pitch, and yaw of the trailer at every time step. Uh, and so we apply derotation based on these values. Um, there are many different conventions for how to apply this rotation with Euler angles. We uh, went for a pitch, roll, yaw convention. Uh, and you can see a formula for how to get the rotation matrix below. Uh, to, in order to uh, counter the rotation that is inherent to the trailer, uh, we invert this rotation matrix uh, to get it back to our, our global, global coordinate frame. After that, we just uh, add on the position of where the trailer is, and that will get us our global terrain data points, uh, the full equation shown below. Uh, this transform is applied to every single ladder point at every single time step. Um, this will get us a, a list of a bunch of different uh, mini maps uh, that we stitch together to form an overall terrain map for our uh, control system to act on. Uh, we can see on the right here that it is accurately mapping a sinusoidal terrain over time. Uh, finally, we don't need to keep all of the data that we are generating from our LiDARs. We only need uh, the terrain data for terrain that is still in front of our trailer. Once the terrain is behind the trailer, uh, we no longer care what it looks like. So we only keep uh, the data for long enough as it is useful to our system. We found out that that is around 2.5 seconds at the speeds we are looking at. Uh, once uh, it has passed that time, uh, the old data is thrown out since it is no longer useful. 
So once we have this terrain map, we need to convert it into a form that's usable for the feed forward controller, because although we've mapped all the terrain in front of the vehicle, the vehicle won't experience all of this terrain. We need to predict its path over this terrain, and from that we can predict the height that it'll experience. So that's the job of the wheel speed look ahead algorithm. It takes in the terrain map, uh, as well as that it takes in the instantaneous velocity and acceleration data that's computed by the sensor on the wheel, and it numerically integrates that to project forward in time uh, the path that the car is expected to travel. That 2D path of XY points is plugged into a K-nearest algorithm uh, that combines the heights of the, we use 10 closest terrain points, and we estimate the heights along that path. Uh, from there, we have a height vector for the left and for the right wheel uh, with corresponding timestamps. We export that to the feed forward controller. And in the pictures below, you can see on the bottom right, this is our sinusoidal terrain. Uh, that red line is the actual path of the car, and the gradient is many, many look-aheads all flying on top of each other. You can see they track pretty much perfectly. Uh, on the bottom left is for a step terrain. The actual path is a little crazy there because of a Weebox bug, but you can see that the look-aheads very nicely map out a step, and that's thanks to the terrain mapping and the wheel speed look-ahead algorithm working together. And so a little bit on the math of that, of that K nearest algorithm. Uh, we have the set of the K 2D terrain points that are closest to any given point that you're looking at. Each, ha each point has a corresponding height. We only project the path forward in 2D space, assuming that the uh, speed will be relatively constant, um, that the uh, car will deal with any variations in terrain height. Um, and so we effectively scale each of our heights by one over distance or one over 0.01 plus distance, just in case we uh, accidentally divide by zero. Uh, we normalize that and we get what's proven to be a very accurate uh, estimate of the heights that the wheels will experience. We did for the numerical integration of the path, we considered more advanced uh, numerical integration methods, there's Runge Kuda methods, there's uh, SV methods, but in the end, a simple Euler method was accurate enough, and in fact, adding complexity uh, reduced the accuracy. There are also some more, uh, more simplistic models that we're skipping over here. Anyways. So taking the real-time terrain map and the real-time look-ahead algorithms and combining them together, uh, we get the whole algorithm pipeline that takes in initial disturbance data from the ground, makes a map of it, um, and then computes what the expected wheel paths are over that terrain, and then outputs that to the controller. Um, so yes, we found that saving the terrain map for about 2.5 seconds covers uh, enough terrain for the wheels to always have uh, terrain um, on them, and then not much terrain is saved once the wheels have passed over it. Um, and as far as the look ahead, look ahead of about a second uh, was uh, sufficient. And the feed forward controller, we were going to implement the entire pipeline, including the controller and WeBots, but ran into a couple bugs that I imagine Remy will address. Um, and so ended up just gathering all of the look ahead data in WeBots and then Bring that over to Simulink. So now I just have a couple of videos showing uh, what a real-time simulation of this LiDAR mapping look-ahead algorithm pipeline uh, looks like. Um, the yellow and purple traces are the expected wheel travel for the next second, and the orange and blue are the terrain from the left and right uh, LiDAR sensors. So now we've discussed the mechanical system, the actual physical vehicle, and we've discussed the algorithms and electronics. And so to bring these two together, we need to discuss the control system. And so the control system will take the data from the algorithms and then tell the mechanical system what to do to get the best outputs. So on the next slide is the block diagram of the control system. So you can see all the way over on the left-hand side at the top is the terrain. Uh, that's the actual height of the ground in front of the vehicle. And 
all the way across the top and that is fed then into the plant uh, that's denoted p and so the plant is what is the actual vehicle so this uh, terrain hits the vehicle and causes some some acceleration uh, some motion and we measure that in y all the way on the right side so the first part of this control system is your very standard feedback control system where we have a feedback loop from the measurements y those are go through some sensor transfer functions and then go through an estimator which i'll discuss later and then that error signal is fed through the feedback controller this feedback controller generates a reference position for the actuator that's denoted rl there um, and then the small closed loop actuator system will do its best to achieve this length uh, via a motor controller and then g which is the actual physical actuator and then this actuator length also feeds into the the main vehicle dynamics which is also measured in y uh, so that this first part this feedback loop is pretty standard and full state feedback and the idea is um or i should say the the goal of the feedback controller is to reduce all the vehicle modes and um, all the motion on sort of the lower frequency scale and um, so vehicle heave the, the up and down direction as well as roll uh, that's what the feedback controller tries to to stabilize as best as it can so then where the algorithms that we just discussed previously come in is in the feed forward controller that's there denoted kf and so to explain the pipeline all the way on the left hand side as jacob discussed that um we sense the terrain with lidar and it's mapped and then as andrew discussed that goes to the wheel speed look ahead algorithm and then from some trajectory planning um we generate a measured terrain w hat as well as a reference um on the state which is in most cases all zeros so this measured terrain w hat goes into a feed forward controller and the goal of the feed forward controller is just to cancel the effect that w has on y so we hit some terrain and we want to minimize the effect that that terrain has on the output of the system and so that's where the uh, the feed forward controller comes in that has access to future data uh, and so uh, ideally we can minimize the effect of the disturbance so moving on to the next slide uh, this is just a comparison of control architectures before we even get into the nitty-gritty control design um, and so this is just showing that the feedback and feed forward design which i just discussed on the previous slide uh, does in fact give us the best dynamic response uh, this is a step response of our system shown with on the top plot this is feedback and feed forward you can see the orange plot which is associated with the actuator starts to respond before the step hits the actual system which is the whole point of feed forward uh, and then the yellow plot y in this case that's just the position of the vehicle you can see it's perturbed significantly less than in just the feedback case where necessarily your system only responds after the disturbance has hit uh, and that perform significantly better than the open loop passive system. So on the next slide, um, we need to discuss a little bit about the, the WeBot simulation. So as Ethan hinted at, um, we were not able to get an end-to-end -end active suspension simulation in WeBots um, just because there was a bug with the actuators. And so instead, we used the WeBot simulation on the passive suspension system compared this to the mathematical model for the passive system and compared those. And then we used that mathematical model having validated it on the active system. And so that's shown here on the plot. The blue is the passive suspension from WeBots. Orange is the passive suspension model. You can see that they match up pretty nicely, which gives us confidence in the, the model. And then the black is the closed loop system. And you can see it's performing significantly better on this terrain. So on the next slide, just a quick note about the state estimator. Uh, we used a common filter, very straightforward to implement, um, lots of resources out there. 
And so we tuned it by approximating the uh, covariance of the disturbance and the noise, and then fine tune based on the uncertainties in our model. Uh, and you can see it looks pretty good. This is just the data from the IMU, but the estimator also outputs the, the full state, which does not include, which, which includes more than just these sensor readings. And then finally on this last, last slide, um, here we have the power spectral density of the heave acceleration that the patient experiences. And so this is for the feedback and feed forward, also the feedback only. Uh, both of those are from the MATLAB sim and then the passive system, which is from WeBoss shown in yellow. And you can see, I guess, as expected, both closed loop systems perform significantly better than the purely passive system and the feedback and feed forward perform even better. Also superimposed here is the exposure limit for vibrations from the ISO standard we talked about before. Um, and so you can see our system meets the requirements that we imposed almost uh, over a quarter ago. So uh, we're very pleased with the results that we achieved. All right, so now that we've presented you with all of our engineering work, uh, I just wanna go over a bit about what we achieved. So in conclusion, uh, in terms of our mechanical implementation, we were able to develop a sound mechanical system that met our weight and cost, as well as our other design requirements, such as the travel we specified before, as well as the ability to travel over the specified terrain that we wanted it and achieve the accelerations we wanted it. Uh, we also utilized optimization tools and iterated on previous designs to improve our design and adjust for encounter issues. On the electronics and control side, uh, we were able to implement uh, well, we were not able to implement a full motion simulation. Uh, we were able to show uh, in, our, in our pipeline that uh, we could significantly reduce uh, accelerations in the critical range that we were testing for. Uh, we also created uh, LIDAR terrain mapping and wheel speed look ahead algorithms that uh, create accurate visuals for our terrain and allowed to accurately predict where our vehicle would go. And this provided uh, sufficient data for our control system to uh, dramatically decrease acceleration when we include these algorithms. Yeah, so in terms of future work, I think we'd really want to go more into the motion simulation. It was really unfortunate that we were unable to get the actuation to function properly to fully integrate our controller, but I think that we did develop a compromise um, that had our data pipeline working and had our Simulink be validated so that way we could sort of trust the results. So in the future, we definitely want to iterate on that and sort of validate that our controller performance is as a section um, meets the requirements that we specified. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Um, and yeah, have a good day.